Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here for the session Frontiers in School Redesign. I, my name is Jeff Wetzler, and I am a co-founder and co-leader of an organization called Transcend that works on school model innovation. In just a minute, we will introduce our panelists, but I have been really looking forward to this conversation with all of you. Um, just to say a little bit about what we're going to focus on today, there's really three essential questions that we're going to be dealing with. The first is, in today's fast-changing world, what constitutes an excellent education? So Teach for America has, you know, continues to talk about one day all children will have the opportunity to attain an excellent education. This session is going to give us a chance to talk a little bit about what is an excellent education and what does that mean and how is that changing over time. The second is, in what ways does the traditional model of schooling, which we'll talk about in a minute, succeed or fail, or succeed or fall short in preparing students, particularly as it relates to the design of the school model? And then the third is, what are the innovative alternatives to the traditional design of school that are being pioneered? Uh, and what can we learn from those who are really on the cutting edge of doing that innovation, uh, which includes the five incredible panelists that we have today? Before we get into the content of the uh, discussion, I want to try to put this, this topic in just a little bit of historical context. I'm sure many of you have heard people refer to the factory model or the industrial model of schooling. And one of the interesting things is that if you go on the internet and you, and you go into Google and you type in classroom 1850, you'll end up with a picture that looks something like this. If you then go and type in classroom 1900, you'll end up with a picture that looks something like this. If you then go in and you type in classroom 2015, you end up with a picture that looks something like this. Not hugely different. There would be, the picture would start to be in color. You might see smart boards, a little, bit, a little bit more of technology. But the basic structure, the basic design of the classroom, the basic design of school has persisted uh, for over 100 years in this country. A couple of quotes just to start us off and to put it into context. Um, this is from Horn and Staker. Today's schools were designed over a century ago to standardize, to create a universal education system that could accommodate large numbers of students. Educators looked at the efficient factory system that had emerged in industrial America. This resulted in batching students by age into grades, placing them in a classroom with one teacher, standardizing teaching and testing. So the system that we have is one that was deliberately designed, and it was deliberately designed to increase access, increase the numbers of students who could participate in schooling, and in many ways it worked. So in 1900, only 50% of five to 19 year olds enrolled in school, but it, by 1930, over 75% of all students entering, of all students were entering high school. So vastly more students, given this efficient, industrial, standardized system, were able to attain an, an education, able to get access to schools. Um, and it's, I think it's important to understand many of the, the benefits to, to millions of students into our country that this model has had. The challenge is that in today's world, in which over 60% of jobs require knowledge workers and we expect schools to educate all children so they realize their fullest human potential, this design falls short. And I think it's important to just acknowledge that this is not meant in any way to take away from the incredible work that students are doing, that teachers are doing, that school leaders are doing, and have been doing for decades all across the country to really squeeze as much value as possible out of this model in ways that have benefited millions of students. It's also not to take away from the tons of creative thinking and, ha and work that teachers and others are doing in classrooms, but it, what it really is to say is that the setup of the model is making it harder than it needs to be for educators and for students to really realize their fullest potential. And so the question that we're wrestling with is, what's the nature of that setup and, and what could it be, how could it be different? And so to, uh, w one last data point and then we'll turn it over to our panelists. Um, if you look on the left at uh, US spending in education uh, per student, it's been growing dramatically over the decades. But if you look at the results that we're getting in terms of educational attainment you know, since like 1975 or so, it's been relatively stagnant. And so anytime you s we see a system that where more and more money is going into it, but the results are relatively flat, it raises all kinds of questions. One hypothesis is the core design of the model that we're pumping more and more money into 
needs to be rethought, needs to be revisited. Um, and that's the topic today. So without any further uh, ado, I want to introduce our panelists. We have Sarah Kotner from Montessori for All. We have Jonathan Johnson from Rooted Schools. We have Chris Rush from New Classrooms, Diane Tavener from Summit Public Schools, and Daisha Toll from Achievement First. Because of some of the internet situations and things like that in this room, we don't have things like live polling, live tweeting, or whatever. But I just want to encourage you to uh, connect with the, with the conversation. So it's at one point during the session, we're going to have, there's microphones, and I'll, I'll let you know when that will be so that you can ask questions. But I would just say if there's things that you hear all along the way that resonate with you, like snap or talk, you know, mention, give us some sense of how, how you're reacting to this as well. And the, and the introductory question for each of our panelists is simply, what makes you passionate about the issue, the question, the challenge of reinventing classrooms and schools? So I'll let them introduce themselves by way of talking about the why for them. Sarah, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to try to tell a 17-year story in four minutes. So here I go. I started as a core member in rural Louisiana, and there were two things that really shaped my perspective. One was how frustrating it was to try to teach everyone the same thing at the same time in the same way. Our district had a pacing guide. We were supposed to teach one objective per day and then move on. The children who were ahead of that were bored. The children who didn't even have the prerequisite skills to, um, to pay attention to the objective were tuned out and frustrated. And so I moved to more of a centers-based model where I could pull together homogenous groups of children and give them activities that were in their zone of proximal development. And they made so much more efficient and effective progress. The other thing that shaped my perspective there was corporal punishment. Our principal would paddle the children when they were making negative choices. And so I tried to never send my children to the principal's office, which is challenging when you're a first year core member with not such great classroom management like myself. And so I resorted to a ton of extrinsic motivation. I gave away raffle tickets to individual children, team points, class points, superstar student of the week, and it worked like magic. My children were motivated, they were kind, their achievement scores skyrocketed, but then they would move into fourth grade and all of that motivation would dissipate. And I stayed for three years hoping that I would just become a better teacher and that I would have more of a transformational impact. But it kept happening. So then I moved to work at a high-performing charter school where there would be consistently good teaching year after year after year. And I learned so much from my colleagues there and I'm still incredibly impressed by the work that they were doing. But the same thing was happening. When our children left our middle school, everything we had tried to instill in them was dissipating. And it led me to start to look for a different model of education. I started reflecting on the factory model of everyone doing the same thing at the same time in the same way. I also started reflecting on my position as a white woman teaching primarily children of color in a model where I felt like we were overemphasizing obedience, compliance, and following directions. And those aren't really the skills that I want to instill in my children for the future, to be leaders and to be transformers of the future. So I started doing observations at elite private schools and I walked into a private Montessori school, and in two minutes I knew my whole life had to change. Instead of looking like a factory, it looked like a Google workplace with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. There was a boy on the floor who had this giant board and he was learning decimals by manipulating materials. And he wasn't chanting math or memorizing it. He was deeply engaging with it. Another child was studying her spelling words for the week independently. Another child was meeting with the teacher to go over her goals. There was a snack on the counter. When the children were hungry, they could feed themselves and then clean up after themselves. There was a bathroom in the classroom. When they needed to go to the bathroom, they could go. They didn't have to ask for permission. Nobody was lining them up and timing them and squirting the soap in their hands. And I was blown blown away by this idea that we have to create an environment that allows children to authentically practice the skills that they need to be self-directed learners in college and to be leaders out in the 21st century workplace. So I went and got my Montessori certification and taught in public Montessori districts and then started a nonprofit organization called Montessori for All, which seeks to open high-performing, authentic Montessori schools that blend the best of progressive education with the best of what we've been learning in high-performing charter schools for the past 20 years. So we opened our first school in Austin. We're getting ready to expand into San Antonio and then start to expand nationally. We also want to create teacher training centers and then eventually partner with districts who want to implement similar models. Thanks, Sarah. Jonathan. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Is on? Is that on? Can you hear? Hello, hello. There we go. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, after being the first, yeah, I think I should just do that. Uh, after being the first in my family to graduate college in 2010, I made a choice to join Teach for America in Greater New Orleans. I was placed at the flagship KIPP school in New Orleans, KIPP Central City Academy. In my second year of teaching, uh, my world changed, and it, it was a, a, a catalyst for the work that I do now. Uh, I came across a young man named Ricky Summers, who by the time that he got to me in eighth grade, had effectively closed a four-year achievement gap in reading and math. And he was able to do that because of the talented teachers and caring teachers that he had for his four years there. Ricky did all of this in the pursuit to go to college and be the first in his family to graduate college out of the belief that if he had this college degree, uh, that was his ticket to the middle class. I get a call spring semester in our eighth grade year at, where the caller says, hey, Mr. Johnson, uh, don't know if you know this, but Ricky sold drugs to support his family. And I, I go, well, I, I didn't know that, but thank you. And the caller goes on to say that, uh, you know, I'm sorry to report that this past weekend during one of these drug deals, Ricky was murdered. Uh, and he's actually murdered by a, a former classmate. Uh, I don't know for those of you who are in the room who have ever experienced uh, a student of yours being murdered um, in the middle of a school year, albeit, uh, but it is one of the strangest feelings that you can ever imagine of anything from guilt to blame to uh, sadness. And so we go to his funeral and they read the results of his uh, explore testing and we find out that Ricky actually is on track to receive full tuition to any state university in Louisiana through something called TOPS, uh, TOPS scholarship. And so heartbreaking because here you have a, a student who is taught by some of the most talented teachers in the country and one of the most celebrated charter networks that we have produced in the past 20, 25 years all in the pursuit to go to college so that he can put food on his family's table. Yet, none of that is enough to help him deal with the material conditions of poverty that he is facing every single day of his life. And so my goal um, was, how do we build a school that does that? How do we build a school that can beat the streets in the fight for student -like, students like Ricky's lives? That's a school that I want to work at. That's a school that I want to found. And so I participate in a design challenge through 4.0 schools and new schools for New Orleans uh, that provided me the opportunity to found the school uh, that uh, I'm here to talk about, Rooted School, which prepares students like Ricky for entry-level jobs in high-wage, high-demand industries starting in New Orleans and hopefully going beyond. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so my name is Chris Rush. Uh, I am the co-founder and chief program officer of a nonprofit called New Classrooms. And we run a program called Teach to One. It used to be called School of One, and we basically run a, a middle school math program and trying to use that as a starting point to, to reimagine the classroom because you need to start someplace. Um, my story starts, uh, to be honest, with my, with my father. Uh, who helped put me in a situation where I have the opportunity to be here talking in front of all of you today. Um, it wasn't like some grand plan, but it was so starting to indoctrinate me into a way of thinking or realizing that something wasn't quite right. Um, I have a little bit of the My Cousin Vinny story. I never was a certified teacher. I did spend some time uh, teaching earth sciences at a school district outside Philadelphia. But, uh, you know, my father was a teacher, my uncle was a teacher, everybody around me 
was a teacher, and that created some appreciation for it. And in fact, he was a math teacher, uh, retired now. Um, and he realized that when I was born, even though he felt that he was a very strong and passionate teacher doing everything that he could, um, being in the system, he realized that I wasn't going to get a fair shake growing up in Philadelphia, um, being in the public school system. So even though we couldn't quite afford it, uh, he figured out some way to scrimp and save and move us to um, a suburban area that had some better schools, and everything started pushing it forward um, from there. And uh, I started out doing a Montessori program um, that really accelerated me in math between having a math teacher's father and a Montessori program. Um, I, by kindergarten, I was doing seventh grade math, and that was awesome and amazing. And when I, by the time I switched to public school, even in the suburbs, uh, I wasn't being challenged. Um, there was this system designed to try to filter me out. That's how it felt anyway. And no one taught me any new math for many years. And I ended up uh, in seventh grade for the first time, someone trying to teach me uh, new math for the first time. It involved the letter X. Um, and I didn't know what the heck that meant. I thought that was multiplication. And uh, I actually developed a minor learning disability and couldn't continue to learn mathematics um, for many years. Struggled with algebra and geometry and calculus um, because I couldn't, I didn't know how to learn math anymore. Um, and the system hadn't met me where I was and there was just this one teacher, uh, Mrs. Moore, who helped me sort of get over that hump and keep me going. So then I tried various things um, after the fact. I did eventually get over that and could learn math and was pretty good at it um, along the way. But it seemed like this whole system just kept being broken, kept trying to push it out. Um, and I first went into some standard industry, worked at IBM, and that wasn't so fulfilling. And uh, then eventually worked at Wireless Generation, which is a education for-profit that became Amplify. And I watched time and time again as sometimes in the for-profit space we had to develop the products and the programs for what people wanted but not what was actually going to change everything. So eventually the only avenue really left was to try to do this differently, to try to figure out a new approach to school and learning so that other people didn't have to go through the things that I did and that so many other people do. And that resulted in uh, creating a nonprofit that's really trying to push on the practice of teachers and figure out how we can how we can change all this so that everybody has has a real shot and that's that's a bit of my story so thank you Great. thank you is the mic on for diane awesome thanks um so i very much resonate with uh both the personal learner stories and the educator stories and um i thought i'd add a little flavor and come at this from the perspective of a parent um, because definitely i'm motivated as an educator and based on my personal journey but um, i'm now the parent of a 13 year old son and um what i see happening with him uh, drives me every single day to think about redesigning our schools and so um, I write in a journal every day, just a couple of sentences, and I track it over the years. So I'm about four years in, and I can, I always write the day's journal and then look back what was happening over the last four years. And so four years ago, my son was in fifth grade in a traditional school model and um, struggling. And there are lots of entries in there where I am pulling my hair out as someone who's been an educator for a really long time and um, he's not getting his work done and it's a battle to have him do his homework every day and I'm frustrated because I can't understand what the teacher is telling me and her assessments and it doesn't make sense to me and I don't have a window in what he's doing. Um, and he's unhappy and I'm unhappy and she's at telling me that maybe he needs to be um, tested for learning disabilities and maybe he just can't write and I'm thinking this is not right there's something wrong here um, and um, the year net after that in sixth grade he moved into one of the schools that I run and it was our first attempt at really fully redesigning um, a school model um, and that that year is riddled with some really tough entries as well where now I have a lot of data. 
and a lot of information about how he's doing, and I'm really not happy with what he's doing on a daily basis. He doesn't know how to learn. What I start to figure out is his idea of learning something is, you know, very cursory or maybe reading once. He doesn't understand what it means to really dig in. Um, he doesn't understand what it means to prepare for a test. He doesn't even have a skill set around that to be able to show what you know. Um, he is struggling to organize his time and um, I can see all of this now. And I also can see that he's starting to be held accountable for learning those skills that will support him. And he's getting support. So I fast forward now to this year when he's in eighth grade and I just flip back through the first sort of part of the year and this is what I'm reading in my journal now, um, which is he literally is coming home and telling me about um, how excited, he's looking ahead to the projects that are coming up and reading the descriptions about what they're going to do because he's so excited about what is coming. He is, um, I can see everything he does and all his work and he knows when to ask me for help but he rarely needs help because he knows how to access it at school. He's on top of things, he's moving through things, he has the skill set to do that. Um, and some of the even more powerful things are, he literally woke me up on a Saturday morning and said, Mom, I need to go to Ellen's house at 9 o'clock this morning because we're working on our business and we have to go get the materials. And in his entrepreneurship class, he's actually started this business with friends. He's negotiating with his principal for space at school, all sorts of things that he just never had space or passion for before. Um, and so it's that type of change in a child in their trajectory that I see firsthand that drives me to want this for every child. Uh, great, good afternoon. What, what a great group of people. Uh, I feel humbled here. So 17 years ago, um, I was part of a group that founded a, ch a charter school in New Haven, Connecticut, um, and we set out to close the achievement gap, and we worked our tails off, heart, mind, body, and soul, and by the metrics at the time, did. Uh, our kids from New Haven were outperforming the kids from Greenwich. Um, and we then thought, well, okay, let's grow this. And another group of people worked their tails off uh, for years. And again, for about a dozen of those last 17 years, as hard as it was and as, uh, as honest as I think we were about the challenges we faced, we really felt like we were walking the talk of our mission. And I think there have been three pretty clear wake-up calls, uh, probably out of fourth, that strike the similar themes on this panel. Um, the first ha has been Common Core, and that when you really are honest about critical thinking skills and what it means to really read rigorous nonfiction, and conceptual understanding in math and application-based problem solving and everything else that goes into it, we all crashed. Um, and what we thought was good enough is nowhere near good enough. The second has been, I've been at this long enough now, that the, the kids I taught sixth grade reading to or seventh grade writing are now to and through college or they're not. Um, and that is the most humbling, the hardest um, data and stories to engage with. And certainly there are successes, but of course what you obsess over are the kids who don't make it, and far too many don't make it. And when you figure out why they haven't made it, um, it has a lot to do with certainly some academic gaps that we need to clear up, especially in the sciences, but far more with how much they wanted it for themselves and whether they could figure out ways to put the whole, the whole life together and the judgment and the going after something um, with all the non-cognitive skills you need to do that. Um, and the third is I too became a mother. And it is interesting how many of us in the early days, maybe we were just working so darn hard, <laughs> couldn't figure out how to date, much less uh, move on from there. And um, it just, you know, now I'm the mother of a six-year-old and four-year-old, uh, one of whom also goes to, the six-year-old goes to first grader at our school. And it just, when you really think about what you want for your own kids, and when you think about what you do for your own kids, uh, and the, the music and the martial arts and the, uh, and, every, and the robotics that you layer on top of whatever the experience is, and you realize the achievement gap is far, is dovetails with an opportunity gap that is far wider. Um, 
And then fourth is uh, on any survey we've ever done uh, of staff. Um, what the happiest will say is I love my colleagues, I'm deeply committed to the mission, and I can't imagine doing this forever. Um, because the work is still, um, 17 years later, just excruciatingly hard um, with the level of sort of emotional um, and time commitment we all give to it. And so I think it just, there just has to be another better way. Um, and so I think we just set out while we try obsessively to get better every year and learn something from, we're now a network of 30 schools, from our great school leaders who are going after it um, in their own way across all the schools and we're still pushing on that. We had to create the headspace and the capacity to think about things differently and engaged in an 18 month R&D project um, with folks from IDEO to come up with a whole new school design and learned a lot from the other folks on this panel. We'll talk about that in a minute. Great. So we've now set the stage for the why as we think about the traditional model of schooling and I think each of you in, in different ways has talked about both what's been successful and how it's fallen short in some profound ways for students. I'm now gonna pose an unfair and an impossible question to each of our panelists, which is to actually describe the what. What is their model? And the reason it's unfair and impossible is who could possibly do that in just a few minutes? Um, so the way, what, what, as we prepared together, what we thought we would do would be to ask each panelist to give you a snapshot of their model, but through a particular dimension of what's different about it of how they are disrupting the traditional model. And this is in no way meant to be the comprehensive look at what their model is, but just a snapshot. And so Jonathan is gonna start us off, and his, the particular theme we've asked him to speak about is reimagining student success and preparing students for different pathways of opportunity. Um, and what we'll do is after, after each panelist speaks for about five minutes or so, We'll just pause for 30 seconds, let you all kind of take it in, capture questions that you may want to have, make notes of what resonates, just because there's going to be a lot coming at you. And then after that, we're going to open it up for some questions. So Jonathan, let me pass you the, the clicker. There you go. And Jeff, are they going to be able to see this or no? Yeah. Uh, I think it'll, it, yeah, there we there go. There we go. Um, so, Rooted School aims to be a leader in sending low-income youth to jobs where they will enjoy the freedoms of the middle class, uh, or that the middle class affords directly after high school. That is the goal that we are pushing for. Uh, how we do that, um, we I think I'm gonna just not do that. Um, so uh, how we do that? Uh, we are structured by the three Ps, um, practice, pathways, and purpose. Uh, for practice, roughly half the school day, students rotate through their gen ed classes through a comprehensive gen ed curriculum, uh, while teachers provide push in and pull out support. So, for students who are really struggling with the conceptual math that they're just talking about, maybe they need more practice. And so a teacher may pull out and do that. Uh, for students who need uh, the rigor to go up, uh, they may get a pull out for that. Uh, the other half of the day, they're engaged in something called, uh, uh, so they're engaged, engaged in pathways, but in pathways is industry focused project based learning. And so this is project based learning that takes in consideration uh, the common core standards uh, and uses that as a framework, but also uses a framework called ASKS, which are attributes, skills, and knowledge. And we get these directly from the industry partners that we are engaged with. And at the moment, we're partnered with about 14 uh, tech companies. Our first school is focusing on career pathways strictly to, to technology uh, and, the, and the, the burgeoning tech sector in New Orleans. Uh, and so we talk to our 3D print um, partners, we talk to our, our partners in software development, we talk to our partners in search engine optimization, and we ask them, uh, you know, what are the attributes, skills, and knowledge that for you, you are looking for, for that entry, in that entry level hire? Uh, which is an interesting framework because 
Um, oftentimes, it's usually the other way around. It's a school asking the industry partners, if they even engage with them, to fit within the constraints that a school is under, whether it be through curriculum constraints or, or structural com constraints or otherwise. And so we're trying to take uh, this retail boutique approach. Uh, students earn credit, they also get the skills needed for possibilities. And so possibilities by the time they're in their junior year roughly, um, they are prepared to spend a portion of their day uh, in paid part-time internships uh, with these partners, making what the federal government um, defines as, uh, as, as high wage, which is whatever the median salary is within any region. And so in a place like Louisiana, uh, the median salary is at about 31 k And so uh, students sort of hit that if they're making roughly $15, $16 an hour. And so uh, our goal through that is to get students the exposure of what it would mean to uh, have this kind of economic opportunity uh, and, and, and what future that might, that might offer them. And so this is like the, the skeleton of it. Um, we, how we have tested or, or, or how, how this looks like now. We have spent the entire year doing a pilot of our model out of the spirit of a movement that came out of 4.0 schools called Tiny Schools, which is this idea that uh, not only do we need to rethink how school is done kind of in, in the ways that uh, the panelists have kind of gotten into and that Jeff highlighted for us so well in the beginning, but in order to rethink school, it, it means that we need to take this sort of little bets approach and this sort of lean startup approach of we've got to test out these components that are, that are unique, that uh, we don't really have exemplary models uh, of success in. And so we have taken that approach to a pilot this entire year where we signed a legal agreement with a local charter network to allow us uh, to work with a small set of their students, under 20 students, for the entire school year, have complete academic responsibility for these students as we run the model full time uh, with me and one other person. Um, and so as you can imagine, I'm, I'm very tired. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and so the goal is to run this model as, as best as we possibly can and, and learn as much as we possibly can uh, prior to launch. Uh, that is, that is, that is our aim and that is our approach to getting at this idea of redefining student success, which is for so long, the narrative of uh, the bar of success for our students has been, let's make them, let's get you to college. Uh, and then we had a move where we were trying to get them not just to, but then through college. Um, but what happens when 30 to 40% of uh, our students aren't uh, are not only not going to college, but aren't making it through college, what does that mean for their, their prospects? What does that mean for the economic opportunity for them in the long run um, when our country has a three-fold employment gap between them and their more well-to-do peers? Uh, that for me is, is a, a, our moral obligation to these kids is to not only address what we often do, which is like the racial injustices that are happening, but also in just the economic opportunities that they're often lacking that are so such a critical piece in fixing what is broken in their lives. Thank you. So I'll give you just a couple moments to jot down questions, thoughts, comments, reflections. Uh, I think I appreciate how you brought up the themes of how do we design backwards, specifically from middle class jobs um, in industries that are prevalent in your local community. How do we actually give students the opportunity not just to sort of get ready for those jobs in the future, but actually be doing that work right now and actually be earning wages from doing that work right now? Um, thank you. Why don't we uh, turn it over now to Chris? And the theme that Chris is going to speak a bit about is personalization of starting point, pace, and modality. So we heard Chris talk about his own you know, gaps between where, what he was capable of and what he, uh, and what he was being asked to do. Oh, I'm I sorry. I apologize. Why don't, we, why don't we go forward to Chris, and then uh, we can back it up just since I've introduced. There's only a few slides to flip through. All right. Don't look, everybody. <laughs> All right. There we go. All right. Um, so, uh, so our flagship model is called Teach to One. 
Um, and it's really about figuring out how do you meet each student where they are. We established this organization um, so that we can, the goal is to deliver on the promise of personalized learning for every student every day. But, and you might hear things about personalized learning, but what does that actually mean? Um, so some people may have heard of us before I was referencing. We started out as a project called School of One out of New York City. And now we have rebranded and renamed ourselves Teach to One. And we are s sort of across the country in nine different states, 27, 28 schools across our entire portfolio, trying to grow fast. Uh, one of the goals of what we're trying to do is to not just create the boutique thing that can work in a particular school that has exceptional teachers. Teachers are a very important part of this, but in many ways we need to make sure that this is something that's replicable for everybody, uh, which means this needs to be able to work in many different spots at many different levels. In the same way that when you go to the doctor, there are specialists out there if there's something unique going on, but you hope that if you have the flu, any doctor across the country can help you diagnose that and be cured. If someone wants to learn how to add fractions or deal with square roots, hopefully any classroom across the country can help teach you these basic type things. Um, so I'm gonna skip through a little bit. The basic premise of what we're doing when we really look at the problem is that students arrive at school with a wide variety of learning needs. Some students are ahead, uh, some students are, are right on target, and some students are multiple grade levels behind. But when you come to the classroom and you're given this textbook that basically says, today you're going to teach adding fractions, tomorrow you're going to teach subtracting fractions, and if there's a student who didn't understand how to add fractions, you know, do your best to try to keep up. Um, so why hasn't this been solved already? There have been many things that have been put into classrooms to try to help this problem, right? And the reality is most of the time they've just been layered on what's happening. Here's an extra program that a teacher can try to insert um, to try to give to a kid. There was the time in the 90s when we tried to put classrooms in each room, and you end, or you tried to put computers in each room, and they would end up sitting in the back of the class. Um, and basically, some of the great teachers out there find a little bit of that extra time. They find that five minutes after class, or before class, or during lunch to try to give you one of these little programs. But there's so much time that's generally lost. And what we realized is, on one side here, you have all of these students with all of these needs. And it's very difficult for teachers to really understand exactly where every kid is each day and what they needed. And on the other side, there's all these resources that have started to come into existence. And the reality is they're not making it to those kids, right? And the teacher needs help. And so many teachers are saying that they can't imagine uh, doing this forever, but it's so important, the work that's happening. So maybe it's that we need to stop sort of just saying we need better teachers, we need better teachers, we need better teachers. And instead, we need a way to set up the system differently so that teachers can be more successful. So everything that we're gonna talk about here is about how we sort of can reinvent this to set up a different basic framework of what's happening in the classroom so that teachers can in fact be more successful. So our math model, Teach to One, tries to personalize what students are learning as well as how they're learning it. Some students learn well from a teacher, some students learn well on their own, some learn well from a computer, some learn better in groups, it varies when they're going to learn the different things, and to some degree, in what part of the room and what kind of environment are they going to learn those things. Um, so it's not just about learning skills, though, um, as was referenced by a number of different panelists up here. We have a broader student success framework that's saying, yeah, skill development and the things on those high-stakes state tests are really important. But there's also time that you need to learn to think critically and how to apply it. Learning how to learn so that you can go forward because we're preparing students not just to add fractions and do circumference of a circle, but we don't know what the skills are going to be 20 years down the road. And it's important that schools are teaching students how to actually learn and to have an appreciation for learning, how to, how to uh, engage with one another. Um, you know, these are all very th is things that are important that school isn't necessarily fully focused on. And so everything else about our model is to try to build a set of tools and a framework to partner with the teacher to sort of open up this bottleneck of sorts to connect these students on one side that have all these different needs and all these different resources on the other side. And I'm just going to sort of skip ahead to the punchline of like, yes, we're curating a ton of lessons out there. Um, we put them through rubrics and we try to find the very best ones, but ultimately, uh, we have a set of skill maps and diagnostics and, and libraries of what each individual student is going to work on. 
um, so that they can then deliver these, this instruction through these different types of modalities. Teacher-led learning is one way of learning. It may be the best way of learning, but it's not the only way to learn. If you have a full classroom and you teach the entire class how to add fractions and half the class gets it and half the class doesn't, you can be the best teacher in the world, but what are you going to do the next day? Are you going to reteach a lesson on adding fractions and bore a set of kids who already got it? Or are you going to move on to subtracting fractions and leave those other kids behind? So maybe, just maybe, we could have them learn in small group collaborations, in independent learning. And then basically the way this works, to sort of close out, and I'm just going to skip ahead, is a student comes to the classroom. They come and they look at some big screen television, sort of like you're going to the airport, that's going to say, so Johnny's going to go one place and Jose's going to go another place. Um, and you're going to meet with a different set of students each day. You're going to get one lesson that might be from a teacher. Then music plays, and you're going to go to a second lesson where you might learn in a group. And then after that, you're going to take a five-question exit slip so we can figure out if you were successful on that particular day. And if you were, we're going to move you on to another skill. And for a student who wasn't, we won't move you on to another skill. We'll give it to you again in a different way. If I can leave you with one thing, think of it a little bit like the Pandora music service. Um, in the sense that it starts building this customized radio station for you based on what you like and don't like. So you're a student, you work well with this Pearson product, not that McGraw-Hill product. You work well in this group with these kids, not those kids. On rainy days, on Tuesdays, you need to work independently because you get riled up. But after gym class, you really need to work in a group. It starts figuring out these different ways that you can learn and then is scheduling you each day and presenting those recommendations to teachers so that they can produce those lessons, doing that analysis, but always still leaving teachers with the right to review, override, and figure out what's up. So we are partnering with uh, public schools, independent schools, charter schools. The idea is for this to be something that can work with everybody, and we look forward to being able to tell you more in the future. Great, thanks. I'll skip back to your slides. So take a moment just and uh, capture questions, thoughts, reflections on what Chris shared, the personalization. OK, so we uh, went on this learning journey, and really including visits to darn near uh, every model up here. Um, and one thing I would say, I think we're going to close out with some advice, but um, please take the opportunity to leverage all the great things that are doing. And the truth is I realized I had had my head down and was talking to the same dozen people about the work. Um, and there really is, in a way that's deeply exciting, a lot of innovation and good work happening across the country. Um, and the first thing you'll do when you, if you go through a formal design process after, after a lot of user-centered work is then try to figure out what are the anchors of a new design. And for us, um, we've always been a, a high expectations religion kind of place. Um, and I think it was the first thing we anchored on, not surprisingly, was keeping that core pillar, but applying it more broadly. So not just having high expectations for academics, but high expectations for enrichment, high expectations for the, the habits of success that are, that are not traditionally academic, whether that's empathy or curiosity or drive, um, and high expectations for, for human motivation. Um, which I think is was the single thing we were trying to dial up more in this model, starting most importantly with kids, just getting them to want it for themselves, um, but also their families and, and our staff. The real new element for us, the newest element for us, was really committing to ownership and personalization um, and not having every kid get the same thing. In fact, trying to err on the side of every student getting something different based on what they need and really owning that learning and then making this a, an awesomely powerful community. And the, and the same thing that, that Chris, I think, hit on in math that we, we needed to take a step back. I think Jeff said this. We were, in essence, executing the traditional model just really well <laughs> in the context of a longer school day, longer school year, unusually um, talented teachers and leaders that we were investing a ton in. And we were running a lot of large group learning with some small group learning and taking a step back and realizing, of course, there are a variety of different learning modalities. And in the new design, really trying to figure out what matches best with what. So if you, if you take a step back and think about what is the best way to learn science, based on talking to cognitive scientists and lots of folks who know a lot about this, the science lab is actually still, when combined with um, a, a kind of close reading of nonfiction text, is what kids need. That can remain. Uh, and should remain large group collaborative learning. 
But when you look at math uh, as an alternative, that is where some of the tech products are at their absolute best and where um, it seems insane to think you're going to give the same math lesson to, to 24 to 30 kids who just happen to be in the same age group um, when they so clearly need things differently. So there's no more large group math learning. Uh, there's just small group math learning and self-directed math learning. Um, and so there's an increase in small group. And then for us, the biggest differences was really doubling down on self-directed learning um, and experiential learning. I'll talk more about that. Um, how many of you are familiar with the flipped classroom model? All right. Not surprising, this is the cool kids panel. Um, <laughs> so in essence, what we did and um, I mean the cool kids are in yeah. the room. Yeah. We're not cool, but they are. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm trying to be cool. All right, thanks for calling me out. <laughs> I meant y'all are cool. Okay, so at the, the, what we in essence have tried to do, and this, this really was inspired by Diane, um, is we tried to flip every course. And so that there is a portion of it that is best learned um, online, primarily the content part of it. And that's reading, that's video, that's simulation. Kids work their way through playlists. And then there's a portion of it that's best learned with peers and teachers. Um, and that, and, and it really maximizes your time and allows you to use the, the teaching and peer time for what's best used for. And that's all tracked using a, a personalized learning platform. And then uh, the other, one of our alumni said to us when we did these focus groups, you know, I got to college and I was so stressed out about choosing, choosing a major and then happened to change her major four times. She said, I wish I had had the chance to try out different careers and interests. Um, and so, uh, again, inspired by Dan, every eight weeks, uh, traditional instruction stops and the kids get one to two weeks to choose from a curated menu of experiential activities and to go deep on an area of passion. And the idea is that they get lit on fire um, by uh, at least one of those and that they get s serious depth exploration um, of those. And then one of the biggest evolutions for us is just really understanding that our most successful alums, and I suspect many of you in this room, are really goal-oriented and you figure out what you want and you figure out the path to get there, and then you periodically stop and reflect as to whether you're on track to get there. And you've got running partners or peers who help you do that. You frequently have mentors or coaches who help you do that, and then you've got an extended network who helps you do that. And we just tried to wrap all those structures around our students uh, on a daily, weekly, and quarterly basis. So they just have a huge community that's investing in them uh, and the pursuit of their goals. Um, and then the last point to staff, uh, I think what you'll learn in any new redesign is teachers still matter, uh, and they matter a ton. But how do we set up the conditions under which great teachers are doing the things that are highest impact um, and can do it in a sustained long way? And so for us, we had to get the pipeline to teaching right. The first year teacher experience is just too brutal. Um, and so really investing in a sort of on-ramp to teaching where you're working mostly with small groups of kids in that first year. Um, and then we had to get the school calendar and school day right, um, where I do believe we still need extended time for kids, especially if we're serious about leadership, especially if we're serious about enrichment, and especially if we're serious about closing the academic gaps. Um, but I think the day is, is uh, over an extended period of time, unsustainable for most adults. And so figuring out how to stagger schedules, figuring out how to have a school year, um, where because of the expeditions, you get the dual benefit for students of these enriching experiences and for staff of the kind of mid-year step back, plan, regroup, reflect. So that's what we're pushing on. We've piloted it in three grades this year. We're expanding it to seven grades next year, and we're learning a ton. Thanks, Tasha. So as you, uh, <laughs> as you just take a moment to reflect and capture, I would just pull out of this the difference between the traditional model, which might be 20 to 30 students in one room with one teacher for most of the day, to multiple different learning modalities. We heard Daisha talking about small group, self-directed, large group, expedition, goal teams, et cetera. Uh, take a moment, capture any thoughts, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who is working her way back through the slides. I'm gonna, and what Sarah's going to talk about is creating classrooms where the environment itself, she began to touch on this, where the environment itself mirrors the worlds that students are going into, as well as the ways in which workplace environments are going to be changing in the future as well. Great. 
All right, so we start with Howard Fuller's premise that our job is not to prepare children for the 21st century, but our job is to prepare children to transform the 21st century. And those are two very different things that require a whole different set of skills. And it's pretty daunting when you start to think about what kind of school it's going to take that truly prepares, not only closes the academic gaps, but then also, in addition to that, prepares children to be the leaders and the innovators of tomorrow, in a, of a future that we can't even begin to imagine. That's the other piece. Um, there's, fortunately, there's a model that's existed for more than 100 years that has been cultivating innovators and leaders, and that is the Montessori method. So these are some members of the creative elite who graduated from Montessori schools and attribute their own success to the fact that they had a model, went through a schooling that cultivated their intrinsic motivation and cultivated their leadership and cultivated their self-direction and helped them find their passion. In Montessori, we talk about closing the achievement gap, we talk about becoming leaders, but we also talk about helping children find their vocation. Where is that place where their own internal happiness aligns with the, with the world's greatest need? And we talk about educating the whole child, and so many of us in schools all across the country are all saying the same thing. We recognize that we have to educate children on all of these dimensions in order to prepare them for college and to prepare them for the 21st century workplace and to prepare them to be leaders in their families and their communities. But it takes a lot of time to do that and we can't just layer in the character. We can't just layer on top the social and emotional learning. It has to be embedded into the very fabric of what our children are doing day in and day out. I've worked at schools where we say, let's structure it, structure it, structure it, structure it until 11th grade, and then we'll give them freedom, and then they'll be ready for, for high school it, or college. And it doesn't work that way. In Montessori, we say, let's teach them freedom from the time they are two months old, because it's going to take them a long time to learn how to handle freedom with responsibility, and that's one of the most important things we can teach them as educators. So in Montessori, there's a whole little article that says, how do you prepare a 16-year-old to handle a car with responsibility? And the answer is, when they're in preschool, no, when they're a toddler, you teach them how to use a knife. When they are in preschool, you teach them how to use a needle. And when they're in elementary school, you teach them how to use fire. It's this idea of having real responsibility and learning how to be careful um, and learning how to self-direct. So in order to teach all that, classrooms need to look very different. Um, our classroom up here on the right shows uh, how it looks like a, a mini society. And that looks like the kind of workplace that we want to prepare our children for. We don't want them to be sitting in facing forward and facing an authority figure, doing the same thing at the same time in the same way. We want them self-directing their activities so our classrooms are structured to look like the world that they're gonna go into. We are intentionally a diverse model, socioeconomically, racially, culturally. It's very hard to give up a spot for a child who's not from a low-income background, but at the end of the day, if we're gonna bring about real racial equity in our country, we really need to educate our children together. They need to learn how to navigate and appreciate lines of difference and become leaders in a multicultural society. We also have multi-age classrooms, so children stay in the same classroom for three years. So they build the strongest connection with the adults in that room. And for children who are coming and experiencing trauma, coming from traumatic backgrounds and experiencing trauma on an ongoing basis, that connection with an adult is what is going to help them heal. We also uh, let children play different roles in each classroom. The first year that they come in, they're the, the babies in the classroom, and they have their mentors, and they see the older work that's happening. They start to get inspired. The second year, they're the middle age group, so they start to practice leadership, and then they are the, uh, in the final year, they're the oldest children, and they're giving lessons, they're taking care of the younger children, and they're synthesizing their leadership. Um, our guides, oh, we call them guides instead of teachers. They are not sages on the stage. They are guides on the side. When you first walk into our classrooms, it's often hard to find where the adults are. They're sitting on the floor giving small group lessons. They're alongside the children. Each classroom has a lead guide and an assistant guide. So this creates a pipeline for leadership so that new people who are interested in getting into this experience can work alongside a master guide um, without having all of that responsibility on their shoulders in their first year. 
We have uninterrupted blocks of work time. So instead of saying three min uh, 30 minutes is for math and 45 minutes is for writing, uh, our children are working in all subject areas for the first three hours in the morning and the two hours in the afternoon. We also, our model is flipped as, as I think it was Daisha was mentioning earlier, with more practice than direct instruction. So the amount of teacher talking time is redu reduced and the amount of teach uh, student practice time is maximized. We also have 100% differentiated instruction. So children are all working at their level in every subject area every minute of the day. And they do this by um, having individualized work plans. This is a sample that you can see up here. When teachers go to Montessori training, they get three years of curriculum uh, in lesson plans that match up to independent practice activities, and then they connect the children with those activities. The assessment is embedded into the model so that the teachers do not have to drop everything to see what their children know. They're constantly collecting data as work is getting completed. They're meeting with children and going over that work so that they're coaching the children to self-assess their own mastery. Behind the scenes, they keep track of where every child is in the curriculum using a software system called Transparent Classroom. And then self-directed learning is a huge part of our model. You'll see an advertisement, a group of children wanted to raise money to get a class gerbil, so they made this advertisement and had a snow cone sale. Um, we had a seven-year-old decide that she wanted to learn more about the periodic table, so she planned her own field trip to the University of Texas. She had to call UT and get a professor to give her a tour. She had to Google map the bus route from school to UT. She had to call a list of chaperones and find a chaperone to go with her. We had another group decide they wanted to donate money to an animal shelter, so they made origami animals and sold them in front of the school and donated $100 to an animal shelter. A another group decided they wanted to become chicken experts, so they had to get an incubator, They had to, and now they give tours for anyone who wants to come learn about chickens at our school. And this is, if, it just, if this is what children are doing when they're seven and eight, imagine what they're gonna be doing when they're 20 and 30 years old. So we are working to um, bring, uh, catalyze human potential at our school and close the achievement gap, but also help children live lives full of, of joy and meaning and then work in partnership with others to do the same. Thank you, Sarah. So we'll have, I'll give you just a moment to capture any thoughts and questions. We have one more panelist, Diane. Um, and after Diane uh, shares, we're going to open up the microphones, and you so there's two microphones here, so get ready with thoughts, questions, et cetera. We'll, we'll have about 15 minutes or so for, for open questions, but let me pass it over to you, Diane. Great. Um, so I think we're going to be able to queue up a video here in just a second. And just so you don't think that I did a cop out and I'm showing you a video so I don't have to talk, that's not the case. But um, I wanted to share with you through the lens of self-directed or kids owning their own learning. Seems ridiculous to me that we would not have student voices in this room if I'm going to talk about that. And so I'd love to hear their voices and then I'll give you a little bit of commentary on that. Ryan, you got the audio? Like, we couldn't go ahead, even though I wanted to go ahead, like, so much. I've learned that I'm smarter than I think I am. I'm more responsible than I think I am. I can stay focused easier. Instead of saying, this is the curriculum that you should learn, it was, okay, let me get to know a little bit more about who you are, what you like, what you want, and then let me figure out how this curriculum can work for you. That's just a very human desire, is to be known and to be seen and to be accepted for who we are. And that is really at the heart of a personalized learning community. That is the most important role of adults, I believe, in any school. Um, but we have the structures here in this model to be able to let teachers actually do that. Even though they're kind of owning the process, you're still owning the space and the environment. And you're still supporting kids and helping kids. So. In some ways, my job is very different than before. In some ways, it's exactly the same as it's always been. Personally, I'm doing much deeper and better teaching, much more purposeful teaching, much more focused teaching, and much more differentiated teaching. My job as a teacher is to help students find their voice and then learn how to use it. So I want them to have the habits that are going to facilitate that happening, like grit and perseverance and knowing what to do if people tell you no. And when we think about personalized learning, it's not the computer, 
it's not the PLP tool that we have. Oh, those are great tools. What it is is a willingness to say, I don't know everything you need, John, but I can ask the question to find out. Pushing myself, that's what I think I'm gonna take away. Cause I think college is gonna be real tough, but you know, this school is teaching me how to push myself to the limits, to the max. Not all square roots are gonna be rational. It feels really good because like, like I learned all that and it, I had a lot of patience with myself, a lot of improvement from sixth grade, and I'm so proud of myself. Actually, to be honest, before I came here, I did not think I was really gonna go to college and all that. I was gonna go to high school, get a job. Coming here kind of like showed me that you know, you are something that you can, you can be whatever you want to be and like nobody can really tell you you can't. And it's just all up to you. No matter where you start, you can always become great. I can do anything I put my mind to. Like nothing is impossible. That if I just work and study hard that I can get to where I wanted to go. So um, I want to leave you, I want to share with you sort of an analogy that I use sometimes that goes straight at the heart of what the fear is that usually is um, suggested or asked or, or presented when I talk about self-directed learning. And that is this fear, and it comes from a good place, that kids aren't actually able or capable to self-direct their learning. If you just let them go, they're going to fall through the cracks or flounder. Um, and so from a good place, we want to sort of control the experience so that they won't um, fall through the cracks. And, and so the way I like to think about self-directed learning and where I think that fear sits is um, if you think about um, an environment that's not self-directed at all, it, it reminds me of the cafeteria that I went to school and ate in in my elementary school with those, you know, trays that have the little compartments and I've never figured out why they were shaped the way that they were like was there food or something I don't know anyway um, because the food that you go down that line and get dumped into your tray is all the same for everyone never really seemed to fit in those little squares and circles um, and no matter if you were big or small or allergic or not like you all got the same thing and you went and sat at those big long tables and the only choice or control you had as a kid was if you ate or you didn't and that was literally it. That was the only ch choice you had. When I think, when I say self-directed learning, I most often think people are thinking that I'm talking about like an all-you-can-eat, all-night buffet. That literally like you walk in and it's the longest thing you've ever seen. There's like filled with crazy, terrible foods. And like they imagine kids taking big plates and just like filling up with mac and cheese and brownies like all night long with no intervention and like stuffing themselves. Um, and that's it, like they do that day after day after day. And um, what I'm actually talking about, and this, uh, so I, you, you need to know, I, I live in Silicon Valley and I live in the city where Google is. Um, and so I actually have lunch at Google, fair amount. And the cafeteria at Google is actually what I think great self-directed learning looks like. Because when you go into the cafeteria at Google, it is like this wonderfully curated experience. You walk in and it's open and it's friendly. You can actually see where the food's being made so you have a sense of where it's coming from. Um, it is laid out in a way that's really attractive but really like thoughtfully portioned. And there's all these signs and directions. They use a color coding system to tell you which foods are really healthy that you should like be eating these every day and which foods are really kind of treat foods and you should probably only think about eating those maybe once a month and so on and so forth. There's all these people around who have made the food, who buy the food, who can tell you where those eggs came from. They actually know the name of the chicken who laid the egg who's in your egg salad sandwich. Like, um, and they're, they're educating you while they're sort of not because they're giving you a lesson, but because they're talking to you with passion about what you're eating and why you're eating and how you're eating it. There's a lot of choice. And I go through and I make my choices, but you know what? They've sized the plates properly, so I won't really overeat. And if I do, I have to go back multiple times. And they've given me a lot of responsibility about, like, 
recycling and what I, I actually go and put my food in the compost pile and things. And if you start throwing food away, you start to feel guilty. So you start taking the right amounts. And like over time, people are developing much better eating habits and the ability to eat well, not just there, but out in the world because they have this experience every single day. And so when I think about a really high quality schooling environment that's preparing kids for self-direction, that's the type of environment I'm talking about. Um, so. Okay, great. Thanks, Diane. I have about a dozen questions I want to pose you, but I actually want to open it up for folks in the, in the room here. Um, what I'll suggest is if you have a question, just come up to either one of the microphones. And um, probably because of time, it'll make sense for, for each question just to have one or two panelists speak to it so that we can get multiple people having a chance to be asking questions. So feel free to either direct your question or folks up here just jump in as you see fit. Well, why don't we start over here? Hi, I'm Mark from Clever. Can uh, we turn the microphone up over here? Yeah. Hello. Hey, I'm Mark from Clever, and this is questions for uh, Diane and Daisha. And many networks prize consistency over experimentation. And I wonder what Summit and AF are doing to actually distill the factors that are the largest leverage for teachers and students in experimenting and figuring out a model that's working better each year rather than just the same year after year. Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, so I, I've talked a lot about how in the beginning um, we knew we needed to change and we just started doing stuff and we very quickly realized that we needed to put a discipline around that work. Um, and so we went to some of the experts, uh, you know, we went to Eric Reese and Lean Startup and have since moved on to improvement science and design thinking. And I think that people don't realize how much discipline there is to this type of work. Um, it sounds great, oh, we're going to experiment and what, no, there's actually a ton of discipline that you have to have, a ton of data that you have to have, a consistency and a commitment. And so um, we prioritize ensuring that anything we're, we're testing or experimenting is going through that very rigorous and disciplined process and that it's not just this kind of lip service type of experimentation, which we actually think is pretty irresponsible. Um, so I think this is a real dilemma, um, and it's certainly one we struggle with a lot in terms of, I, I don't know if it's, for me, there's no religion in consistency. Like that in and of itself doesn't have value. Collective effort does have value. And, and I do think one of the things is you, as you get further and further into this work and so, like you can't Google your way to common core mastery, right? Like there is a richness to the, quality of curricular materials and resources and tasks that we should be fronting in front of kids. You certainly can't sort of experiment your way into, into building the, um, really systematically building curiosity and empathy. And like there, we're, thankfully we are learning a lot more uh, as, a, as a whole sector about how to do these things well. So I would say the same thing, like it, it's particularly when you're dealing with kids and the trajectory of their lives, it's not a let a thousand flowers bloom um, and I just believe we won't be more, we won't be as effective that way as opposed to having teams of people who all dig in and agree to a common approach. And what we're trying to do is to get the balance right between moving forward with intense collective effort on the things that are shown to work to the best of our ability right now and creating extreme intentionality around piloting. Um, and piloting with the kind of rigor Diane talked about and piloting for success, like where we are really investing in having, whether it's individual teachers or whole schools, kind of intentionally go off script and try and do something better. And then we're such an incredibly database, student-focused place that the things that work spread pretty rapidly from that. Thanks. Let's go over here. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Adam Roberts, uh, Director of Innovation here at KIPP DC, and thank you to the panel um, for everything you've shared. Uh, when I, th when I, a theme I heard from everyone today was really a theme of freedom, uh, and when I think back to my uh, 2007 Institute experience, that was not a key message that I was left with. It was definitely a message of control and what was sort of my role in controlling my classroom. Uh, and you're all really talking a lot about sort of undoing that and really giving agency to students, you know, everything from the summit model to Montessori. And so I'm curious, as, as you're here in a, in a room uh, where this is probably one of the largest teacher training programs in the country, right? What message might you give to folks that are designing the 2016 or 2017 uh, Teach America curriculum about how to approach a classroom to be successful in a school like yours? Sarah, you want to start? Sure. I actually don't think it's about 
giving up control, I think it's redirecting what it is that you control. So in Montessori, there's a lot of control um, that goes into preparing the materials, preparing the lessons, and then preparing the environment. And so there's, that's where you direct your energy. Instead of trying to control the children within that environment, you, you direct your energy into preparing the perfect kind of environment that will allow children to teach themselves. So it goes back to Diane, what Diane was saying, there's still so much control that goes into that Google cafeteria. They're portioning it, they're making the signs. That's where the control goes instead of putting the food on the child's plate. I'd also add to that and say that um, freedom allow. there's a number of people who are gonna do good things with that freedom. And yes, there are gonna be those few who do, who do start to fall through the cracks or that teacher that is gonna struggle with what's going on. But you have to realize how many people actually can be successful in that space and set up some of the safety nets um, and the monitoring systems to be able to catch those falling between the cracks and then bringing them back into something safe or something that's gonna work out for them. These are real students, these are real teachers. We can't just sort of like try things and be like, oh well, that didn't work. Um, so I think it's a combination of those two that's really important. Thanks. Let's go over here. Uh, good afternoon, my name is uh, Garrett. Uh, I wanna thank all of the panelists for the work that you're doing. Uh, my question is around intentional diversity. It's something that really stood out for me when I heard the word. It immediately made me think of the exact opposite, which is intentional segregation, which is what I experience every day when I go to work with my students in uh, Hamilton Heights in Par Harlem, New York. Uh, so you all probably know New York City is the most racially diverse, but also the most racially segregated school system in the country. How in the world did you get parents in the community and your politicians to be open to diversity in the classroom? Um, so uh, we run intentionally diverse schools. All of the summit schools are intentionally diverse. It's one of my um, personal greatest passions. Um, and, and I actually think that personalizing and intentional diversity are really <laughs> important and key to, to bring together. Um, you know, there are so many societal elements that create the, the, the segregation that we have, and it can feel overwhelming and daunting to try to think about tackling those. So the strategy we've used is to try to create um, school environments that are attractive to everyone, and so they really want to go there and learn together, um, and position them in places where it's easier access to get to them for the students who are low income or have the harder time getting there. Um, and we've been pretty darn successful at that and then show them as proof points to everyone possible. But honestly, that's like a drop in the bucket. There is so much more work to be done. I would, um, so our program grew up in New York City uh, to start. So I think it's a very relevant, challenging question. And you really do find different uh, school populations where there are some parents that are highly engaged, there are some parents who uh, are sort of afraid of anything different, there are some parents that don't engage at all. Um, and we found that one, str one tangible strategy that we'd recommend is sort of openness with parents and some ability for choice. Uh, so I'll give you two examples. One is we have an online portal that really highlights most of the things that the parents care about as far as what was their son or daughter doing that day, what were they working on, who were they working with, how did they do. So let's make sure that the parents can see that so there's not some like secret experiment going off to the, so going on to the side. Um, and then secondly, I think there's about bringing the parents in to actually not only see what's going on, but giving them choice. One of, the, one of our early principals um, in, a, in one of our Brooklyn schools figured out that let the students push to continue. So we had we have one classroom of students who weren't doing this particular thing so that a parent could choose to opt out and have their children uh, participate in the traditional classroom. For the most part, when a parent pulls their children out of the program to go into a traditional classroom, it does not last more than a week until the student is demanding to be back in. And that way, we weren't sort of mandating this, um, but instead the parents had an, a degree of choice and openness. Thank you. So what, just a note to folks who are asking questions, it's a little hard to hear sometimes, so can you make sure you're close to the microphone when you ask? Hi, my name is Scott. Uh, I work on the Connecticut team. Um, thank you so much for sharing everything that you've done uh, 
and that you're continuing to do. I've heard a lot of innovation that's happening in terms of school-based learning. Um, it sounds really exciting and very meaningful and, and impactful. I'm left wondering, as part of your school reform, um, is innovation happening in terms of how you're supporting parents and empowering parents uh, to, to have more meaningful, more impactful home-based learning? Is there innovation happening to move away from some of the traditional homework worksheets, reading logs, read an article before class? Like, is innovation happening there on top of what's happening in terms of school-based learning? I can jump in. Yeah. I, I think one of the things, it, it, if you have a model that's self-directed, it can happen and should happen anytime, everywhere. It was like, oh, it's a snow day. No problem. Uh, <laughs> you can keep learning. And so I, I think that there's, and in talking to parents, I would say in particular in the last several years about Common Core, it's just a very frightening thing. E even if you were trying to help your kids before, you feel like this is a game changer and I don't know how to do it. Um, and if you have good self-directed resources, then parents can sit side by side with, with students and engage. And because, and I, I think we're all trying to work on the user interface that makes it as clear as possible, but if you do it well, it's so much clearer. This is what my child knows. This is what my child doesn't know. If, if it's red and my child doesn't know it, I can double click on it and very clearly see what has to be done. Um, and so I actually think all of the learning is just so much more accessible um, than it was before for parents who do want to get engaged. And then I think one of the things we're trying to do with, with this concept of a dream team is, is demystify the whole thing and have um, uh, parents come in not just on their own, because again, some of that can be overwhelming, but they can enlist other supports, the kid can enlist other supports, whether it's coaches, big brother or sister, um, neighbor, pastor, and all come in and the student leads the presentation of this is what I'm learning, this is what I'm working on, these are my goals, and everybody rallies around the goals. And it may be that the parent's gonna help with an academic part of the goals, but because the goals are more broadly defined, it may be if I'm working on empathy, frankly, that's as easy to practice at home as it is in school. Um, and you just have more of a sense of collective effort on all of it. For the sake of time, let's take two more large group questions because there's a couple topics I know the panelists want to have some lively discussion among themselves about uh, and I want to introduce. So let's take the next two questions and for those whose questions didn't come, everyone will stay afterwards so you should feel f completely free to come back and continue to ask questions. But why don't we come over here? Thank you. Uh, my name is Callie. I'm a seventh grade world history teacher um, and we have a one-to-one -one model in terms of technology, um, which is great, but I still have, you know, 35 average kids in a class and I'm still the only person in that room. So my question is really about what kind of innovation is around like the physical classroom space. And I'm hearing a lot of ideas of like, oh, internships as learning opportunities, but in what ways are you rethinking like that school building as a center of learning? Um, and the desk and a computer as a, as a vehicle of learning, the innovations around, the, you know, the realities of 35, 12-year-olds with hormones and, and one teacher in a space. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, go for it, Chris. Yeah, so um, we started out uh, sort of knocking down all the walls between the classrooms uh, to create space. So imagine you have four or five classrooms, you knock down the walls so you can have large areas and small areas, you can have lounge areas, you can have round tables so that groups can have so more equal conversations, you can have lecture type space. Um, and I think it can play uh, a meaningful part of what a student is going to experience, both in the school and outside of the school. Um, but. In, at, at scale, we start to see that the number of people are sort of struggling to be able to create those types of spaces, to be able to modify that. Um, so I think there's a lot of little things that you can do in an individual classroom, but if you're on the high level, and we can follow up afterwards, I can show you all sorts of lessons learned on that type of thing. The different learning environments really do help you connect more and more to different kids at different times um, for where it is, so I'd want to encourage you very much to um, continue down that path and to try to do that in your classroom. I'll try to be brief. Hi, I'm Natalie, and I will just echo what everyone else said. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been such an incredible session. Um, we began the session talking about how the current model really isn't working and we need reform. Um, and then what sort of came up at the end of the panel is, but there is that fear there of 
the unknown of uncertainty of something so radically different. And um, I taught here in Washington, but I'm from the other Washington, and I currently live there now in Seattle. And um, this school year, our charter schools that we just started this year were deemed unconstitutional. And I just wondered if any of you could speak to uh, a little bit more of what you do when you run up against that kind of fear of the unknown and something so different, either if it's from parents who are uncertain to send their kids somewhere so different when what's already has already failed them, or whether it's the community, or whether it's politicians, or the legislature, you know, just what have you done to kind of sell yourself um, to take that risk of something so different? Uh, I can um, take, oh. Great. Um, yeah, I've had to do a, a lot of selling uh, in order to do the pilot that I'm doing. Um, not only on the stakeholder side with the industry partners, but also, hey, parent of this child, uh, I know you're enrolled in this school, but hey, can you opt in to root it for a year? Um, and, and what I've found is that, you know, I believe in shitty first drafts. So uh, I, I believe, you know, that there is a value in putting whatever that draft is, uh, the best draft uh, that you possibly have in front of whoever is using the, the product. Um, so in my case, uh, you know, I do pitch to parents, I do pitch to industry partners and like here is the model and yes it's incomplete and there are a lot of kinks that we've got to figure it out but here it is and through a process of shipping it, getting feedback from it, adapting, shipping more, there's this evolution in the product uh, that ultimately uh, will lead, I think, to a, des a desired end. And so my, my advice would be just to jump. Uh, just to add something to that, I think there's a, it's also important when you're starting on these types of pilots to find a match of the need and the desire, right? So finding places that recognize that what they're doing isn't working and populations there so that when you hit some of those stumbling blocks, when you took that leap, um, that they're with you on the like, well, let's try something else because going back to that old thing really still wasn't working. And that allows you to build a little bit of a track record. And then as you have a track record and you can show results, you can start going to some of the audiences that aren't just looking to like out of desperation or really need a change, but the ones that are looking to get the leg up to really accelerate themselves. So that, that initial match um, and selection for your pilots can be very critical. Can I just add one quick thing in there? Uh, because we too are in Washington, two schools that were charter schools and now are home schools, two of the best home schools in the country, um, temporarily. So, and what's interesting though is how many of our families actually stayed with us through that. And so literally almost every family. And so I just wouldn't um, minimize the importance of trust. Like at the end of the day, uh, we are in the business of taking families' most precious thing that they have, and they turn that child over to us, and they have to trust us. And so um, that doesn't mean that they won't forgive us if we make mistakes, but we have to be honest about that. We have to explain why, and we have to be trustworthy. And um, in my experience, when and we are trustworthy, our families will stick with us. Um, and of course you have to do right by their kids, but if that's what your, your focus is and they trust you, they will stay with you. So I wanna pick up on a couple of the themes of the questions, including the one that was just asked around change and fear and trust, but also on the thread that someone mentioned earlier around freedom um, and the role of freedom and autonomy and, and responsibility for students. And, and this is a chance I'd love for panelists to even talk with each other a bit as well. Um, in your observation or in your experience, is it possible for schools to move to these new models that might technically look different on the surface, but have underneath the same cultural orientation of compliance towards students? Have you seen that? Um, and how do you guard against that risk? Any thoughts, comments? I mean, I think this is one of my, my biggest worries because all the reasons why we've implemented schools the way we've implemented them for the past 20 years are coming from a good place. They're coming from the urgency that we feel to do right by children and to help them close these gaps because if the gaps don't get closed, then we know that their life prospects are abysmal. And so when you feel that urgency, then it's really hard to 
step back and let children make a mistake. It's really hard to step back and let them waste even a minute of time walking over to look at the fish tank because you just feel like if you're not reading, like you're not going to close that gap. And so I, I just, I've, in collaborating with colleagues around the country, I see that th there's still this tendency to hold on to that control and that um, this idea that we have to start with so much structure bef and children sort of have to earn their freedom instead of defaulting to the freedom and restricting the freedom if children aren't ready for the freedom. I, I you know, I, there is a conversation where a school leader was explaining that they still do the like, you need to walk silently in the hallways with your hands behind your back, but that he tries to move quickly away from that. But even that premise of needing to start in that place and needing to default to the idea that every child needs that kind of structure, um, it's, it's hearkening back to, to the old model that I think we really need to move away from. Um, and also, this may offend a lot of people in this room, the carpets that have the squares where the children need to sit in the square, they have their own square that they have to sit in so that they don't get too close to another child. I think those are part of the problem. Like we ha our children have to learn how to be able to sit down and say, oh, I'm, I'm too close to you, Chris. Let me scoot over a little bit. It's part of the learning process. It's not as efficient, but it, it's part of what they have to learn. Um, so be on the lookout for those carpets and think about whether you really need those carpets <laughs> or not. I, I think it's possible, Jeff, if we start smaller. And it's something that really excites me about the whole micro school movement, which has largely been concentrated on micro private schools that stay under like 150 kids total. But I think it would be really interesting if we saw a, a move for more public schools uh, who are interested in, in, in making this shift out of these compliance-based models and, and, and into embracing more of this freedom. Uh, to, you know, w what would it look like if we started building schools that, uh, public schools that capped at 150? Uh, you know, high schools where, you know, all, you know, 9 through 12, you, you have a school that is 150. Uh, I think we, we build and we design and we innovate with the assumption that um, schools have to be big. And I think when, when we are designing with that, in mind, um, I think that leaves room for a lot of compromise in a lot of the other aims and aspirations that we are striving to achieve. Yeah, I, I don't know about you guys, but I think one of the biggest dangers here is that it's pretty easy to start getting into design and get excited about that and think about the kids and then um, not acknowledge that we actually have to change what we do as adults. And that's potentially the biggest change. Um, and um, what I think is really important about that is not just saying that and thinking, oh, well, we just need to change, but acknowledging that um, there's, there's a whole potential mourning process that goes on in there. I don't know how many of you um, sort of when you became a teacher, this was certainly true for me, like had a, a, a image of what great teaching was and, and, and that got reinforced. And, you know, when I was a teacher, you know, people thought I was doing great teaching when I was in front of the classroom in inner city LA with 40 kids in the room and they were all doing what I wanted them to do and they were like watching me and like I got a lot of reinforcement for that, a lot. And I don't get a lot of reinforcement if people walk in and the room's kind of noisy and there's kids all over the place and they, it's not clear what they're doing and heaven forbid if one of them is on their phone in the back, then I am the miserable failure teacher, right? And, but that's honestly like, I have to come to a place where I'm gonna be able to live with myself as an educator and understand that it's not just I let my kids go crazy, like I am literally doing different roles now, more powerful roles that I am confident are yielding better results for kids. And, and um, but that's hard, you know, and there's not a lot of people going around and patting you on the back for that. And so um, I think that's the biggest danger. Just one follow-up, Diane, on that point. What's the mental process you take yourself through to come to terms with that? So when you do see a student in the back of the room or a setup where students don't technically look on task uh, and, and knowing what's at stake for our students, how do you think about that? 
Yeah, um, so I have this great story of when we first started this work, there was this one kid who literally was that kid for three weeks. Like he did not do anything for three weeks, a ninth grader. And um, it, it was one of the most painful experiences to like walk by that kid every day and, and see that he wasn't doing anything. But you know, about the end of the third week, he sort of calls his teacher over and he says, you know, I think I'm behind. And the teacher who knows this kid's track record, K-8, literally social, socially promoted every single year, like has never met a standard ever in his life, um, says, you know, those three weeks were the best weeks he ever spent in school because he actually had the epiphany. And that's where that was our starting point for getting him to begin to engage and learn and own his learning. And honestly, if he had been in our school four years before, we would have just picked that kid up and carried him across the finish line four years later. We would have picked him up every step of the way and so intensely supported and scaffolded him. And we would have gotten him through. And we, we would have gotten him accepted to a four-year college. And I guarantee you he would not have made it. I guarantee you that. And now he actually has a chance. But it took three weeks of nothing to get there. Com other comments or reactions? Yeah. I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out how to, because I'm not quite on the same religion. We've still got carpets with boxes. And I, I, I guess I'm just, I, I, I guess I would just encourage, I, I, I fundamentally got into this work because of idealism and values, right? But I would just, and it's why I think you're hearing from all of us the importance of piloting because a lot is at stake. Um, and the truth is there are some quote unquote freedoms that we put in initially that I think were just the wrong bets. And, and it's not that it's so clear what you should or shouldn't do, but I'll give you an example. So I think that, the, two examples. One is we did self-directed learning in large groups. Maybe some of my peers up here will do it, but we had, when you have 60 10-year-olds in a room, um, including with associate teachers, like, it's not a good idea. I now know that. And, I, and I, I think now we put it in small groups and the kids are much more successful. And maybe we can scaffold our way to larger group learning. But I, for me, those, those weeks are preciously lost. Um, and I think I just I think that is we made the wrong structural decision. I also think there are issues and and control can be such a loaded word, which is why I try not to use it. But um, there are some choices that are not available to kids, and I would say specifically disrespect to each other and to and to teachers needs to be taken with an extreme level of seriousness. And as we all know from, from our first year teaching experience, or perhaps from others, once you let some of those things get away from you, it's so darn hard to pull it back, and you can literally poison the environment. And so I, I, just, I think some of these things are nuanced in terms of how you create the conditions under which students are gonna show up as their best selves and be more intentional about that. I mean, as we have, in part inspired by Sarah, a portion of the day that looks Montessori-like. Um, we, we went through and sort of systematically more, I'm sure than Sarah would, showed students exactly how they should, how to approach each one of the activities in a more scaffolded way, and then it can be a beautiful thing. But I think there is a certain responsibility on us to create the conditions under which kids are gonna be successful, and I'll just say, there's an idealism that if you're not careful can actually lead, in our case, lead us down the wrong path. I think, uh, so for my organization, we are in a slightly different position than some of the other folks up here, as in we don't run the schools, and Diane's getting into that world too. Um, and I, th I think what you're hearing play out is people have a lot of strong opinions about what is right for students and what is right for schools and wrong for schools. And one of the lessons that we are semi-painfully learning as we scale um, is that even though we had our own sort of orthodox of what was right and wrong to start, that if we're gonna partner, we need to think about not just the student learning, but we need to think about the adult 
um, change management and learning in that process as well. And that sometimes learning is a struggle. And if there are these different philosophies to what's going on, how do we leave room for the schools themselves to, to learn the lesson about whether or not the box on the carpet is good or bad or good or bad for them and not be sort of this like tisk tisk taskmaster that becomes adversarial with our schools, but instead is a partner in that learning and saying, and maybe warning them and recommending some things along the way and then reflecting with them to refine and adjust um, as you go. And I think, Jeff, to the origin of your question of the folks that sort of want to make this look different at the top, and um, but then underneath it's really still the same thing, it's starting to understand what are the motivations for it to be the same thing. Did they really want to change? And of course, there might be 10% of people out there that are just actually posers and have no interest in changing anything. <laughs> I'm sure that's about to get tweeted out now. Um, <laughs> so um, for the last couple of minutes, just in closing, I want to pose one last question for each panelist to give us just about one minute of an answer, which is, suppose that you are in this room or you were watching uh, in the simulcast of this, and you are either somewhere between intrigued or compelled by what you're hearing up here, um, but you're working in a traditionally designed environment, whether you're a teacher or, or a dean or a coach or a school leader. Um, what would be your advice to folks here who might be in those environments feeling that way um, based on your experience and what you're sharing so far? So anyone, just jump in. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to get started and go quickly. Um, so I, uh, we have a philosophy of being very open and sharing, and I actually think that's what is most important in our field. I think we tend to be too closed and not look up. Um, and so for the last 13 years, I've wanted to be able to share. Um, I think doing the type of work we've done is such a heavy lift. I can't imagine trying to have do it trying to do it as an individual teacher in a classroom by myself. Like, and I tried really hard, but like the, the stuff we're talking about. And so I actually think there are some like tools and, and pieces that teachers can take to make it easier. And so we literally um, have made available, and I'm excited for the first time, it is literally available and you can get it today. Um, all of the curriculum we've curated, all of the assessments we've curated, and uh, starting this summer, an individual teacher version of our platform that individual teachers can take and use for free and play with and experiment with and design their own model on. Um, and so that would be my advice is, is um, you know, don't go it alone. Grab some, you know, take advantage of that and take it and make it your own and make it better. I think I, I, my first advice was going to be find a team um, because I do think you need thought partners in this work. Um, I think you've already heard from a lot of us start small. Um, one space you could go is after school, summer school. Like some of these are lower stakes environments where I think you can you can often get the capacity to run a little more wild or take take a class or two classes or a grade level. Um, and run a different approach, or a portion of the day, and run a different approach. Um, and I and I would add the same thing. We're making all of our sort, all of our stuff open source available. And I would I, I hope all of us make the whole sector behave that way, um, and facilitate the kind of sharing so that you can take what we've done and make it better uh, and give it back. Um, and I I, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um. I want, I want to echo the find a little bit of the lower stakes environment um, to start. Summer school, after school, uh, before school programs are definitely helpful. They're, they're more forgiving um, to echo that. But I think also you need to identify the situation that you're in. Um, do you have a team of people? Are there a lot of resources towards what you want to do? Is there a lot of time? Um, and I've been telling people recently to think of, uh, think of students as investments. Um, in many cases, and you're about to go out there and, uh, and and sort of muck a little bit. And if it's the same thing, like you're trying to figure out your retirement funds, you could go work with E-Trade and lose all your money, or do something fantastic. Are you in the spot where you have the knowledge to be able to do that? Do you need some more services that are going to help support you and recommend what's going on and partner with you? So you might need a J.P. Morgan Chase, a Goldman Sachs to help manage those investments, or do you just want to sort of like looking for the silver bullet where you're trying, you're saying, I don't have capacity and I just want to hand it over. 
um, to somebody and maybe I want to put it in a mutual fund or something like that. And I think that's the difference of some of the different setups that some of us bring about whether or not there are just tools out there to help you, whether or not there are supports and recommendations, or whether or not you're going to have someone come in and try to adopt a very regimented and, and strict model. And I think that understanding where you are is important. When I was in my core member placement site, it was a very top-down scripted school from 9.43 to 9.45 every day. We were supposed to be doing the two-minute edit, and the district personnel would run down the hallway and check on each of us to make sure we were doing it when they were on campus. And even in that environment, I, I found that I could, that my locus of control was bigger than I thought it was. And there were two ways that I really owned and pushed my locus of control. One was picking my battles and identifying times when I really could try to influence and motivate the people above me to let me try things out in my classroom. Going to my principal and saying, may I please do a pilot where I do centers-based mathematics instruction. I'll show you the baseline achievement levels, and then in a month I'll show you what the achievement levels are and we can see if it makes a difference. Um, so owning that, not just complaining about what's going on, but saying how can I make a difference. The other one was honestly just creative maladjustment and sometimes just closing my door when I knew that they weren't going to be checking on me, when I wasn't allowed to do community meetings and problem solving circles. I did them anyway because I knew that my students needed those. Um, so kind of those two approaches have worked for me in, in the past 17 years. Yeah, two things I'll add to what has already been said. One is <clears throat> getting really clear in your mind about what is so broken that you're wanting to fix. Like be very crystal clear about that um, and, and what is the, the desired outcome. So if this behavior system is fixed or if this new design for a classroom space is fixed, what will I see different and, and what is that outcome that uh, I'm, I'm imagining um, is important for, for my students. The second thing is um, if you are one of those crazed people that are really interested in starting a, a new school uh, because of something that you've uh, defined or identified as broken, um, there is a, a toolkit uh, that we also have made available. Um, it's called the Tiny School tool Toolkit. Uh, you can, if you Google that uh, with 4.0 schools, you'll get a lot of the um, the, the, the uh, resources that we've used to uh, try out this, this piloting and, and, and prototyping approach to launching a new school. I believe that this kind of student-centered and rigorous innovation that our five panelists have been talking about is one of the most important strands of the next wave of this field. And I hope that the courage and the creativity and the, just the sheer persistence and the practical wisdom that they are all bringing has come through in this. I just want to thank them, and I'm going to put all of their websites up. I hope everyone checks it out. Thank you all very much. And I'm sure folks will be here if you want to come ask questions.